Welcome to Casual Friday. When I started doing Casual Fridays a year ago, I didn't even know if I was going to have enough material to keep this going for three or four months. I really didn't know how long it was going to last. And as it turns out, I have a lot to say about knitting. <laughs> and a lot of it is, is just wanting to share what I've learned about things as I, as I go through my knitting life. I did think I would share with you some of the goals that I have in my knitting life. And then I'd love to hear what sort of goals you might have in store for 2019 as well. So as I've mentioned in a number of previous Casual Fridays, I typically with a project start with the project and then figure out what the yarn is going to be. So I don't, I'm not a stasher except for sock yarn because I know I can knit a pair of socks with those things. But I do accumulate also fingering weight yarn in solids and tonals thinking that I could use them to knit socks, but it turns out I really prefer the mindlessness of self-striping sock yarn for socks. So I have a lot of fingering weight yarn that I haven't used. I either intended to use for socks or uh, I was a member of a, a sock club one year and I the yarns that I really loved uh, and the patterns that I really loved, I knit with those right away and the rest went in my stash and then they've just been sitting there. And every once in a while I get the idea I'm going to knit some sort of a shawl or wrap uh, with fingering weight yarn and I buy the yarn and then it sits in my stash. So I really want to make an effort to use those yarns that I typically bought for a purpose that didn't get used for that purpose and see if I can find a way to use those yarns. So in 2016, I went through my entire office and kind of decluttered it and figured out what yarn I had that I no longer wanted and put it aside to give to the textile center for their annual garage sale. I went through all my books, all my patterns, and then I went through my uh, works in progress and I real I took every single one out. Anything that had been st stashed in a bin or a box or a bag, um, sometimes for more than 20 years, I took it all out and I evaluated it and decided that I had more than 40, 40 things. So once I got over, the, over that, um, I went through and I evaluated whether or not I wanted to continue knitting this item. And if I didn't, then what was I going to do with it? Or did I want to put off making a decision on that particular item um, until later in the year? So I really made a huge dent in that pile of of unfinished projects and I decided at that point that from then on every February I would do finish it February. Well since I spent the entire year of 2016 finishing things by the time February of 2017 came around I really didn't have anything to finish I just had active projects that I was working on. So this past year in 2018 by that point, I had accumulated a few things and I got through almost everything. And since then, I have tended to finish things <laughs> in part because of casual Fridays. It's like I want to show progress on the things that I've made. I want to show you the finished item. And so I don't have many unfinished things. I have two sweaters I'm currently working on, my Aaron sweater and then this Edwardian era sweater. And I have a couple of pairs of socks from last year that things went wrong with them and I just put them aside and, and haven't done it. So I've been thinking about, well, and somebody has asked me, are you going to do finish it February again? And I've been thinking, well, I don't need it, but you guys might need it. So I will be in, in February doing Finish It February. I'm just going to repurpose it in order to accomplish knitting or craft related goals that are separate from my works in progress. So we have a basement in our house. It's an unfinished basement. We have the laundry room down there, the furnace is down there. It's where I shoot my uh, overhead um, knitting things when, when you see the overhead stuff and I'm demonstrating techniques that's I have that set up in the middle of um, sort of the largest part of the basement but there's a separate room down there that I always refer to as my craft room and it, it, it was it was created in the 1970s by the previous owners of the house it was created as a dark room so it has some linoleum um, floor and it's horrible fluorescent lighting and but it has a door and it has 
a closet and I put shelves in there. And a long time ago when I was first organizing all of my knitting things, that was the room where I stored everything. The lighting is terrible. It's not a comfortable place to be really in the winter. There's, there's no windows because that's why it's a dark room. And it's where, but I do have my sewing machine down there set up all the time. And it's really a dumping ground for anything that's not knitting related. It might be sewing related or other sorts of crafts. And it's just, it's like a junk room. It's horrible. I don't like being down there. It hasn't been cleaned in a long time. It's probably really dusty. So my plan for February is to do something about that room. And I'll do it a little bit at a time. I'll be able to break it down into um, manageable pieces and then just take care of that room. And I probably need to, to redo my office as well. Uh, you guys can't see the floor <laughs> in here or my desk right now. And it's just getting to that point where, okay, it's time to take care of it. So that's probably what I'll be doing for Finish It February. It is related to knitting and being able to knit in a peaceful and beautiful environment and also be able to find things um, when I need them. I have a couple other goals as well. One is uh, that I learned to spin last summer and I was doing a lot over the summer. And then, then I hit a, a point where I wasn't spinning anymore and I went to a retreat and kind of got back into it. And then again, I haven't been, been spinning. And so I'd really like to make an effort to once a week, pick a particular day of the week and make sure that I'm spending time spinning. I kind of have a rhythm to my year, my knitting year. I knit year round, but I do knit different kinds of things at different times of the year and I do different sorts of things. So one of the things that I really like to do this year is to release more patterns. I re-released, I updated and re-released a pattern um, this fall. It was my very first pattern I'd ever done and I, it was from 10 years ago and I re-released it. And I'd really like to release um, some new um, designs and patterns this year and it's something that I just haven't done. I'm designing all the time, you know, making things either for myself or other people, but uh, I, I don't typically end up turning those things into patterns and then releasing them. And, in, and mostly it has to do with that final bit of work that's required in releasing a pattern that has nothing really to do with knitting and everything to do with details, which is not what I like but it's very re rewarding to me once I do release a pattern. Um, so I really want to make sure I do that several times this year. Another thing that I would like to do is get back into teaching in person, at least occasionally. I really enjoy that process and I just haven't done it. I've been so involved in, um, in putting all of my teaching energies into teaching on camera, but I really would like to to teach in person at least occasionally. So again, I'm really interested in knowing what your knitting goals or knitting related goals are for this year. And I would like you to start thinking about Finish It February. I'll talk about it more at the end of January, what it means and see if, if, if it's something that you might be interested in. So last weekend, somebody on Twitter um, posted a link to this story on the BBC radio about an exhibition in a museum in Scotland. And that exhibition is on embroidered samplers knit by girls uh, in, in, I think the 17th or maybe 18th and 19th centuries. And they were from the collection of, a, she's either American or Canadian, I'm not sure. She began collecting these samplers and some of them are um, samplers from a whole family, a group of sisters and maybe even their mothers or grandmothers, a neighbors, cousins, whatever. And, and she just began to see the progression of what the samplers had, had been originally and the colors that were used and then the kinds of details that were included in samplers as time went on. They're incredibly intricate and you can see a gallery of all of the samplers online. I'll put some links down in the description. The story on the radio is really interesting. They talk about how these samplers were a reflection of the education of these girls. So often they would have the alphabet on there because the way that they learned to read was by reciting the alphabet. And then they would, uh, in order, and they were learning to read in order to read the Bible. And so they sometimes there'd be Bible, Bible verses in there. There's an example of one, a uh, sampler where there was the multiplication table 
was embroidered in, into it. You know, women were often responsible for the household finances and, and keeping track of all that. So being able to do that was really important. So I just, it, it was really fascinating to me. And in some of the, the samplers are incredibly intricate and amazing. I mean, they're done by very young girls, like eight, nine years old. Just incredible. So I'm gonna leave links down below so you can listen to the radio story and also see the online um, exhibit as well. So I want to update you now on my two projects. So the first one is the one that I'm designing myself. It's my Erin sweater, or as they would say in the UK, my Erin jumper. And so I'm, I'm going to do some overheads so you can see where I am. I really made a lot of changes this week. To me, it's very much the same sweater, but when I look when I look at what the swatch I had last week was compared to what I have now, it's obviously completely different. But in my mind, what I was starting with in my head, it's all very much part of that, um, that original thing I had in, in my head. So uh, I'll show you that and then um, we'll come back. So this is what I had last week. This is where I left it last week. And I was going to swap this particular cable out, which is very much like the one that exists in the center panel. I was going to swap that out for something else. Uh, I really liked this one. I was going to keep that. Wasn't sure what I was going to do about these single column of honeycombs. So I let it sit for a few days. And what I decided was that I didn't enjoy working. I like the way this looks, but I don't enjoy knitting it. Just for this kind of the same reason I wasn't enjoying this one. I wasn't completely happy <laughs> with the honeycomb. And while I like this, I didn't feel like it belonged. I just, it wasn't coming together for me. And I was pretty pretty certain that I wanted to keep this moss stitch, double moss stitch um, over here on the left because I, I like the, the four row pattern. I like the fact that the wrong side rows um, are just knit your knits and purl your pearls. I started looking through my stitch dictionaries and I decided I wanted to do a different pattern in the middle, one that was similar to the one that I had in terms of it could be widened if I needed to. This, this can be widened with multiples of eight stitches. And so I decided I liked working this one better. I found another couple of cables that I liked. And again, I still had this syncopated alternating cable over here. And I just decided to get rid of this. And you'll note that there's some seed stitch in here, not moss stitch. So I decided as I changed to seed stitch at the side panel here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be swatching in the actual yarn and I'll be widening this center panel by another eight stitches, which is going to eliminate this eight stitch panel here. So the side panels are just going to be this wide and then the center panel is going to be um, wider than what it is right here. And then I'll, I'll fill out the sides with the seed stitch. So someone asked in the comments what makes this an Aran sweater? Is it the cables? The, the Aran sweater was, was developed in the 1930s and then gained, really gained popularity and commercial appeal in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So in Alice Starmore's book, where she really goes over the history of the Aran sweater and examining the pieces that they have in the museum that she believes shows the evolution of the Aran sweater from the Scottish Gansey, which was a true fisherman's uh, working shirt, um, to the Aran sweater. So the Aran sweater was never worn as a fisherman's garment. It's often referred to as a fisherman's sweater, but it was never worn um, by fishermen. So the elements of a, an Aran sweater are that you have uh, vertical cable panels, and there's a, a big center panel right here that's quite large right here that's a cable panel and then on either side it's flanked by other vertical panels that are of textured stitches cables baubles various things like that and in some cases you're going to see cables going all the way to the sides and in other cases you're going to see uh, filler stitch here so every piece of the garment and it's Technically should be knit flat, but there's nothing keeping people from knitting them in the round, but technically they were knit flat. Um, and each piece would have this central panel. So in some cases you have the side 
uh, shoulder saddles. So the sleeve would come down like this and it too would have either this identical central panel or maybe another one that was a little thinner. Um, but you'd have that down there and you may or may not have additional ca cable panels on either side. You might just use the filler stitch um, on here. But these were a, for a, a drop shoulder. It's going to be a very square shaped front and back. You don't have to knit a drop shoulder. You could do a modified drop shoulder like this, which is what I'm doing. And that's one reason I like to use a filler stitch right here so that my cable panels can all fit within um, this particular span right there. You'll also see different kinds of sleeve types. You'll see raglan sleeves. You could see v-neck um, collars. You could see all, all sorts of things. But the and the classic Aran sweater is going to be made from a thick cream color undyed wool. And that's where the Aran yarn weight gets its, its name from, I'm fairly certain, is because these sweaters were, were traditionally knit in a thicker yarn than what you'd see um, otherwise for sweaters prior to that. Like the Fisherman Gansies were knit from a, a thinner yarn weight than um, what these cream colored Aaron's were. So you'll see Aaron sweaters in other colors. You won't necessarily see them knit in the kind of wool that's kind of very scratchy and may, may or may not have lanolin in it to help with the water resistance. Again, these were not actually worn as fisherman um, sweaters. My Aaron sweater is based on, this is the central panel and it, on either side of that central panel, it's going to be flanked um, by these these, these two cables together are going to make up a panel that will be mirrored on the other side of the central panel. And then I'll fill in with the filler stitch here. This is where I am on my Edwardian sweater that I was showing you last week. So I finished the back and what you, when you get up to the back, at the top of the back, you knit across the shoulder stitches, bind off the next stitches and then you put these on hold and then you continue down the front and and what it called for was knitting a couple of inches across the shoulder and then casting on for the front so let me show you how wide this front is this front is just as wide as the back it goes all the way across here but this fabric is kind of like an accordion pleating on its own so i've been puzzling about how the collar was going to attach to this because the the next time the next piece i'm going to have to knit is the left front and it's going to be just as wide as well and this is all going to be uh, joined together with buttons somehow but not button holes in the fabric so you, there'll be ribbon attached i don't know how wide the ribbon is supposed to be a ribbon attached to the back sides and then the buttons and buttonholes somehow are supposed to be in those ribbons. And so it hasn't been clear to me if there's supposed to be some overlap and how much overlap there is supposed to be. But I, I, I've been looking at these Columbia uh, uh, knitting books that came out. Uh, the, the original newspaper article where I saw the sweater had one image, which I'll show you right here. And then that was in a newspaper from 1906. Then I found the sweater in a 1904 knitting book and it looked like this, it looked more like what we've got here. And then I began looking at, Columbia produced this, this um, their, their book of knitting yarns every year. And often the same patterns appeared in from one publication to from one edition to the next and they would add they kept adding more and more things the the book kept getting bigger and bigger but then they would start taking some things out because fashions of course would change and one of the things that they began adding was photographs of the stitch patterns and in the 1908 version of the book there's a photograph of a woman wearing this sweater and then you can really see what it's supposed to look like and it's photographed from the front and it made it a little bit more obvious that that the way that this is going to be joined is probably there'd just be a little bit of overlap i just wasn't sure 
how much this was going to get stretched out and how much overlap there was. But just because of the three-dimensional nature of this fabric, I think there is no way that there could be much overlap. And it naturally sort of um, gathers up on its own. So I, this is all going to have to be eased into the collar when it's knit, but I do have a clearer idea of how this is constructed. So uh, one of the things that had puzzled me was why on the back, let me turn this around. So on the back, there were armhole decreases and no, no binding off, just armhole decreases. And so from the point where those decreases stopped to um, the point where we are right here was only five inches. From this point here where the back of the neck was bound off to the point where underarm stitches are cast on was seven inches. And I was trying to understand why the back was only like about five and a half inches, something like that, and why the front was about seven inches. Um, I, I just couldn't understand it. And then as I was lying in bed one night, I realized this this isn't just front of the neck, this is centering the neck. And so so essentially this neckline is is completely centered. This the front and the back are positioned at the same place. And I, be, I began looking at men's sweaters and I realized that men's sweaters were were knit, constructed in very in a very similar way, but they weren't created in a way that's going to create that front pouch. Um, essentially the front and the back of the men's sweaters were exactly the same. Um, the difference being the men's um, back of the sweater was perfectly rectangular up to the top of the shoulders and then there was some straightaway part and then they would just cast on the same number of stitches they bound off for the neck they would cast on again and then they would do all of the cast on for the underarm um, from the fronts. And, and that would go there. And so I started thinking about, I wanted to go further and back and see, I knew that sweaters were, as we know them, are sort of a 20th century invention. I knew that they had kind of appeared as outerwear in the late 19th century. So I wanted to go through the newspapers and see when was the earliest sweater pattern that I could find and and see if I could find, you know, sort of the origins of the sweater. I had heard somewhere that they originally were, were worn um, and to, to play football, for example, um, but I, I really wasn't completely sure about that. One of the problems with looking in newspapers for, for knitting patterns is that it, there's a couple, couple of, of challenges to that. First of all, the knitting patterns I was finding were in big city newspapers. So they were in, in newspapers that were published daily. And these patterns, I haven't confirmed this completely, but I think the patterns um, were all part of this, this um, especially in the Boston Globe where I'm finding a lot of them, part of this sort of homemaker's corner, household hints type of thing. There would be recipes, there would be um, crochet and knitting and, and all sorts of other sort of things that would appeal to women and a lot of them were user submitted. So so that's one of the challenges that they have. It's got to be in a big city paper. I looked in one of the uh, weekly newspapers that my ancestors appeared in a lot in, in this uh, Wisconsin community just to see if, if any sort of knitting pattern had ever appeared in there and I couldn't find anything. And that, that kind of makes sense to me. There, those newspapers were published once a week. They went to the everyone in the county that contained news that was the front page news was county news or uh, federal news, government, international news that was from the wire. And then there would be separate little columns for each of the townships within the county. And so it's like the Facebook of you know the late 19th century you're like so and so had a visitor this person went to a milwaukee for the for an outing or um mrs jones is is sick with you know some disease or something and it was it was those kinds of things so you didn't have like a homemaker's corner type of thing so you wouldn't see knitting patterns in those weekly newspapers they were only in the big city papers but as i was searching for the term sweater one of the hits I got was from, I, I was searching by decade. I was looking from like 1890 to 1900 to see if I could find anything. And then I was looking 1880 to 1890. And I found an article from the Glasgow, Scotland newspaper. And the hit I got said something about Irish sweaters. 
Now this really surprised me because first of all, they were using the term sweater in a newspaper from the UK and I had thought they used the term jumper or jersey, not sweater. And secondly, the phrase Irish sweaters. I thought, is everybody wrong about when Aaron sweaters originated or Aaron jumpers originated, um, which was like the 1930s. Um, what, what are they talking about in 1880? And so I looked at the article and it was, a, <laughs> it was not about a garment, a wool garment that was knitted that anybody was wearing. Sweaters were the term used for somebody who operated a sweatshop. So they were talking about sweatshops in Glasgow that were operated by Scotch and Irish sweaters and how they were using a lot of um, immigrants and were, who were poorly treated and, and all that to, to work in their sweatshops. So I was like, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. That's why the UK maybe didn't use the term sweater for one of these, but instead used a different word. So I was trying to figure out, well, why were we using it in the United States? Why did we use the term sweater? And it turns out that a sweater originally meant any sort of garment that you wore that would cause you to sweat or that you would wear while sweating. So one article I found talked about how if you want to, um, if you want to make progress on weight reduction, what you would, should do is use three wool sweaters. And they're talking about um, like wool fabric, uh, covering yourself from shoulders to loins and wrap yourself up in that and, and then go do some activity that's going to cause you to sweat and then you'll lose some weight. So originally, um, that's <laughs> a, a sweater could have been anything that would cause you to sweat or that you would wear while you were sweating, which makes sense about why it's something that was originally athletic wear. During the 19th century, because of the Industrial Revolution, the middle class was expanding and, the, and people were getting rich and, and these people had more leisure time and they were starting to explore athletics. And so the games of golf, tennis, uh, yachting, which I assume means sailing, um, just hiking, things like that, um, were activities that you might want to wear a sweater because first of all, they allowed you to move easily. And secondly, they're going to keep you, they, there was this belief that it would keep you from catching a cold if, while you're sweating, that that would keep you more comfortable. Well, another thing that happened around that time period is that uh, the bicycle was undergoing a lot of changes over the course of you know the mid 1800s into the late 19th century. And one of the, the, the innovations was the safety bicycle. And the safety bicycle had two wheels that were the same size instead of a little one and a giant one. So you didn't have to climb up to get onto it. Women were not bicycling before this because it was too dangerous. It was, a, it was dangerous to begin with. And then they had their clothes that they had to deal with. So they weren't bicycling using those types of bicycles. The safety bike had wheels that were the same size and it had, you could coast on it. So I think it had some kind of a chain and it had coaster brakes. So, and it had a frame that was um, much more stable as well. And so it became really appealing and a really appealing piece of transportation for women. They could, and so there was this huge biking craze in, in 1896 just swept the country and people were, people were, buying bicycles right and left and women were bicycling and there was this huge uproar about whether or not it was appropriate for women to be out bicycling and straddling a bicycle seat that might affect their ability to bear children um their ankles might be exposed and it was just and and it, it was just you know sending people into a tizzy so one of the very earliest sweaters for women that I found was a bicycling sweater it was actually it I found it in in a knitting book from 1897 and it has huge Lego muffin uh, sleeves and it's just labeled as an athletic sweater so the Met Museum has an example of that sweater it's slightly different than what's in the book in the pattern book the pattern book mentions that you can alter the the fancy stitch and that they use that 
that's listed in the pattern and you can use your own. And I think that that's what the knitter did here. So you can see this sweater, it used three different needle sizes. So there was a larger needle size and there was a sort of a medium one for the ribbing uh, at the waist and then at the neck and cuffs, they used an incredibly uh, tiny uh, needle for that. So as an example of how tiny, how tight those cuffs were, this sweater that I'm knitting, this Edwardian sweater, um, it's, it's worsted weight wool, five stitches per inch. So I'm using whatever, I think I'm using a size six needle. I need, I need that for a five stitches an inch. And it was calling for stainless steel or, or steel needles. And the size needle, I think it was 14, which is like a triple zero needle. It's like one and a half to two, one and a half millimeters in current standards. Uh, I'm not using that for this. I'm going to try that for the neck just to see um, what it is. I don't have a triple triple aught needle. I might have a double aught, uh, and we'll see if my hands can even take uh, knitting that at, at that um, at at those gauges. We'll we'll see. But bicycling was one of the activities like the, you needed comfortable clothing to to do these athletic activities and bicycling because so many women were doing it and it gave them independence and freedom that they didn't have before and the women's suffrage movement was was there trying to get women the right to vote and so there are a lot of societal influences and one of the one of the movements that was that was part of all of this was the rational dress movement so bloomers had been a thing earlier in the 1800s um, and it kind of died out. People were getting so ridiculed, women were getting ridiculed for wearing them, but it was something that was that that women and men were wearing what they called knickerbockers while they bicycled because you don't want to get your clothes caught in a bicycle chain and women their skirts in particular if, if they're too voluminous they're going to get caught in the um in the spokes of the tires and and so they were so women were wearing knickerbockers to ride bicycles which again was a scandal this whole rational dress movement really kind of pushed um the heavily corseted figure and um, frou-frou clothing gradually diminished as we entered the 20th century and got past the Edwardian era. So what I found in that 1908 book that has the sweater that I'm knitting, had the third image of the sweater that I had found and actually had a photograph of somebody wearing it. One of the things that I was noticing in that particular edition of the book was that there were other styles of sweater that were showing up that were more relaxed and longer and just more comfortable. And so as, as we headed into World War I, the clothing got simpler. More women were working in offices and they were, they were wearing much more tailored clothing as well. So that the clothing just was getting simpler and simpler. So one of the things that I, I was, I kept, running into was how Coco Chanel was, was responsible for the uh, popularity of the sweater, like as a fashion item. And I thought, but the sweater was older than that. It was 40, it had been around for 30, 40 years by the time she was um, designing, I felt. And I didn't understand why she was being given credit for making the sweater popular. And what I discovered was that in World War I, when fabric, especially wool and fabrics were really difficult uh, to get a hold of, she was buying jersey fabric. And jersey fabric is basically stock, fine gauge stockinette fabric that was manufactured on the Isle of Jersey um, in the UK. And it was, it was used for undergarments, men's un long underwear and women's undergarments. So there had been knitted shirts and, and long underwear and all that kind of thing made from knit fabric, but it had been machine knit fabric. And so she was buying that and it was inexpensive and it was available. And so she started making this um, sportswear, which now makes sense to me why it's called sportswear is because it was made from knitted fabric and it was easy it was relaxed it was easy to move in um, and it draped differently um, 
and you know, didn't require a corset type of thing. So when the 1920s came in and you had very different silhouettes for what women were wearing and they were bobbing their hair, she was the big influence for that. So this information about this Jersey fabric made me understand why in the UK, the old term for jumper, like what we in the US call a sweater, um, that they call a jumper in the UK had been and sometimes maybe still is depending on the regional differences called a jersey and it all comes back to the sports jerseys and the jersey fabric that was produced on the island of Jersey that's knitted stockinette fabric and what those original items were made from, but then how hand knitters began making their own sweaters. Uh, one of the things that I found in these knitting books was this quote, um, sweaters you knit yourself have a value that can't be measured in money. And I also saw um, some newspaper articles talking about fashions um, for people who are yachting and or at the seaside. They're like, those who know how to knit, there's this huge fad for, for knitting amongst those who know how to knit, which I thought was really interesting because we, a lot of us have this perception that everybody knew how to knit back in the day and they didn't. Many people did know how to knit and they, many people had to knit in order to clothe their families, but the people who were going to the seaside and who were yachting and who were buying bicycles and who were playing golf were not the people necessarily who knew how to knit. They didn't need to, they could purchase whatever they wanted. They, did, they could have somebody do it for them. And so not everybody knew how to knit. And I, you know, I found things in the newspaper about instruction we have we've hired an expert knitter who can teach you to knit so knitting was becoming a popular thing to do especially to knit your own sweaters but not everybody knew how to do that and so you could get lessons on how to do that in the cities where I assume you're more likely to find um, people who had the kind of wealth that wouldn't have required them to learn how to knit. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. And I'd also love to hear what your knitting goals are for 2019. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.